Afternoon. Just a short uh, travel announcement here, and we'll get right after it. Um, I think you probably saw our announcement, but the Secretary will be traveling to Tipperary, Ireland, on the 30th of October, where he will meet with the Irish Foreign Minister, Charles Flanagan, for a discussion about the Northern Ireland peace process and a range of regional and global issues. And while he's there, the Secretary will also accept the Tipperary International Peace Award, which will be awarded by the Tipperary Peace Convention to honor the Secretary's efforts uh, to end conflicts in a number of countries. <coughs> the Secretary will then travel to London uh, on the 31st to meet with international counterparts for a discussion about the situation in Libya uh, and ways to improve support for the Government of National Accord. While he's there, he will also accept two awards, the Benjamin Franklin House Medal for Leadership and the Chatham House Prize, which I think we've already talked a little bit about. Um, and as you know, the Chatham House Prize is given to a state's person for significant contributions to the improvement of international relations. The Secretary was named the 2016 recipient jointly with Iranian Foreign Minister Javad Zarif. The Benjamin Franklin House Medal for Leadership is being given to Secretary Kerry for his lasting contributions to diplomacy, public service, and human rights. The medal recognizes those individuals who follow in Benjamin Franklin's footsteps by exemplifying great vision, cross-cultural understanding, effectiveness, and intellectual rigor. While he's in London, the Secretary will also have an opportunity to sit down with the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, and together with the Mayor, engage in a discussion uh, with London youth on current issues, including climate change and countering violent extremism. So it's a short trip, but lots going on inside of it, and the Secretary is looking forward to that. They will leave Saturday evening. Will he be home in time for Thanksgiving? For Not for Thanksgiving, for uh, Halloween, excuse I, me? I don't think. I think he's going to miss trick-or-treating. Uh, I'll take a look but at But he's uh, being honored for public service and human rights. And but he's going to miss out on the M&Ms and the candy bars. Yeah, okay. uh, I don't think he's going to make it back in time for that. Uh, Matt. Um, I just wanted, uh, you've seen the reports, the news about this um, shooting outside the embassy in Nairobi? Yes. Just wondering if you can um, offer us any any details that you might have about yeah. what, what, what yeah. happened. Yeah. Let me get you there. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, yeah. Where is it? Elizabeth. Here it is, right on the top. I looked in Africa. She put it right in the top under uh, uh, American citizens. So we can confirm uh, uh, that there was a shooting incident today near our U.S. Embassy in Nairobi. Kenyan security personnel responded uh, swiftly, uh, and the incident appears now to be over. No embassy personnel were injured in this attack, and we know of no other U.S. citizens that were involved. The embassy is closed for the evening, and the ambassador and senior staff are reviewing their operations for tomorrow. Now, obviously, we're going to continue to closely monitor the situation, and we will release information as needed to help U.S. citizens make informed travel decisions. Um, last thing I'll say is it's obviously very early here uh, in, the, uh, in the wake of this, um, of this incident, uh, and the investigation uh, by Kenyan authorities is just now starting. So we'll be in close communication with Kenyan authorities as they look at this. Uh, and we're going to obviously await the results of that investigation to assess any po possible follow-on actions by the embassy. Uh, but you have no uh, idea as to the motive of this, the guy who was, what, why he was there, what he was? I don't have anything that I can report specifically about uh, motive uh, or what the intention was. Can, can you be clear just on our, our reporting at least says that uh, that a knife-wielding man whom Kenyan police described as a criminal was shot dead outside the embassy in Nairobi. You described it as a shooting incident. I just want to be clear. The, is it your understanding that there were shots exchanged, or was this, as we've been told, a man with a knife who was shot dead by security personnel? My understanding is, early on, uh, that, the, the, that the individual was brandishing a knife um, and uh, the, the, and uh, it was security forces which uh, which engaged uh, with gunfire. But again, very early on, I think we need to let the investigators do their job. But that's my early understanding. And, and it's your understanding that he was, that the man was indeed killed? That's my understanding, that, and, that, that, that the man brandishing the knife was killed by security forces. And then last thing, and I realize you said that it's early uh, in the investigation, but um, 
do as of now uh, do you have any reason to suspect that uh, the man had links to terrorist or militant groups I, I don't know I, I don't know I've seen the press reporting of you know what he is reported to have exclaimed uh, right before security forces engaged but I'm not in a position to confirm the accuracy of that I, I don't know um, and I don't know at all what motivations might have might have been behind this. Uh, we'll just let the investigators do their jobs. But. Okay. Matt, did you have something else? Well, I just wanted to get I, the what has become a daily non-update update, I guess, on the discussions about Syria and particular, particular the um, situation in Aleppo, um, the discussions that are going on in Geneva, but also if there have been any additional conversations. Um, the, their, the meetings in Geneva continue. I don't have anything specifically to read out. Uh, they're still talking. We still have uh, gaps we're trying to close, um, and I don't have additional conversations yeah. to, to read out with respect to the Secretary. Yesterday you were asked about the Amnesty International report. <clears throat> Do you have About anything? the civilian casualties? Yes. I, I, this is about the, the report that the Pentagon's under counting. Is that what you're talking about? I believe it was a report that talked about a, n a number of civilians being killed in strikes that you guys have said that you were involved in. I believe that's the, the one that you were asked about yesterday, and you said you were, were looking at the report. And I'm just wondering if you have any update. I don't have an update. I think we're still going through that, but I, I, I'm not sure you and I are talking about the same one. Um, I believe what you're talking about is we were being asked about uh, an amnesty report that said the Pentagon was undercounting. They have been there. And, um, uh, as far as I know, uh, both both here at the State Department and the Pentagon are still you know, going through that. And as I said yesterday, I'll take the opportunity to say it again, we take all credible allegations seriously, and uh, unlike other nations, we actually investigate them. And, and when we learn our lessons from them, we tell people what we've learned and we try to fix it. But I just don't have an update. Can I talk, um, can we go back to Aleppo? Um, yesterday was a very contentious meeting at the UN Security Council. Um, particularly um, of charges of war crimes by UN amb U.S. Ambassador to UN Sam Power. Um, essentially, Russia. I'm sure you've seen the comments. Russia was kind of taking credit for, you know, the pause in airstrikes, and and basically, Ambassador Power says, "Well, you know, you don't get congratulations for stopping for a week from committing war crimes." So I'm just wondering, um, was that a personal reflection? Has this um, administration concluded that Russia is indeed committing war crimes in Syria? There have been other countries, Britain, France, um, their foreign ministers have said that what's going on in Aleppo consider, um, is considered war crimes. And now, um, in the wake of the attack uh, in Idlib on the school, um, killing over a dozen children, I'm wondering if, oh, how over, that affects your calculation. Over two dozen is the latest count that I have in that school in Idlib. Um, look, I, I think the Secretary has been equally uh, as candid and forthright about this and, and, and saying that what he's seeing can, be, can only be couched as violations of international law. The term war crimes itself has a very legalistic definition, and it's not for me at this podium uh, or, or for us here at the State Department to, 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 to make you know, that definitive well, why qualification. Well, for you, but it was for Ambassador Power to well, say that yesterday. I think Ambassador Power was simply restating what we have all said uh, is our assessment that these are violations of international law. But, no, but she the, specifically said war crimes, and I know that we go back on this back and forth. Is there an effort within this building to make a determination of whether that's war crimes and whether that would be referred to the International Criminal Court? I mean, I know you're trying to parse this out, but I mean, she said war crimes. The secretary said that an investigation of war crimes is is appropriate, mm -hmm. and this has gone beyond violations of international law now. I'm wondering where you are in your trajectory in terms of trying to make a determination. It's not up to the State Department to make a determination, Elise, but as the Secretary has said, uh, he does believe that what's going on is worthy of investigation uh, you know, by the international community, and the determination of, of uh, war crimes is, uh, that's a, it's a, it, it, uh, it needs to be made by, appropriate, uh, by an appropriate judicial process, uh, not by one cabinet agency just you know, making a declaration of it. I think we've been very clear. I don't think you have to look any further than transcripts to see 
where the secretary's head is on what's going on here. Uh, but he recognizes that war crimes has a very legalistic definition, and that the, it, that's why he wants it to be the, it to be investigated. He wants it to be looked at. He wants to he wants there to be a determination well, by the international are, community one way or the other. Okay. Well, where are you on that? I mean, the secretary made some kind of vague remarks saying, well, you know, we should consider whether we want to investigate this as war crimes. Is the U.S. calling for a formal investigation of whether war crimes are being committed? I mean, you wouldn't be alone. There's the British, there's the French. Today, U.N. Secretary Ban Ki-moon said something about if this school attack was delivered, it would be considered a war crime. You're the head of UNICEF. So, I mean, it's not like you're on, on a limb here. And where are you in terms of working with the international community to see if war crimes are being committed. We are still having conversations inside the international community about next steps, and I'm not going to get ahead of that. We stay with Aleppo and Syria? Sure. Um, uh, Russian President Putin is quoted as having said today that Russia has uh, no option but to clear Aleppo of what he described as a, quote, nest of terrorists, close quote, uh, despite the fact that civilians are also present in the city. Um, do you have uh, any comment on his apparent intent to continue uh, the attack on Aleppo? Well, I mean, it, uh, his comments are not inconsistent with the actions that we've seen uh, in recent days, if not weeks, by the Russian military and the Assad regime. Um, I think the secretary addressed this himself in saying that, you know, when we were asked about this flotilla that was heading uh, ostensibly into the uh, – Mediterranean, that if that's their intention to uh, to reduce uh, Aleppo to rubble, then uh, they will do nothing more than a, a, a encourage the opposition to keep fighting, make a cessation of hostilities all the more elusive, if not impossible, um, and bolster uh, uh, the, the rise of extremism uh, in Aleppo, as well as prolong a war um, that uh, should not be, I mean, you would think, you would hope that, that, that the Russians would see that's clearly not in, in their interest. But uh, the President's comments today uh, are sadly all too in keeping with the actions we've seen uh, out of uh, Russian military forces. And the Russian Defense Ministry spokesman is quoted as saying that Russia, Russian planes uh, did not enter the Syrian region where the school was hit um, yesterday. Uh, I've seen that the White House has since said that they believe it was either Russian or Syrian planes. Do you, uh, do you believe the Russian denial that their planes were in that area, and therefore do you conclude that it was Syrian planes, or do you have an open mind and you have made a, reached a judgment on this? I would completely concur with my White House colleague that we, uh, we, we we're not sure exactly uh, whose aircraft it was, but uh, we know uh, information that we have make, makes it indicates that it was either Russian or Syrian, well, and I just don't know. What, I mean, is there a suggestion? I think that the coalition has already spoken to the fact that they had no aircraft in the area, and the only other ones it could be is Russia and Syria. I just don't know which. Okay, yeah. Um, yesterday, General Townsend stressed the importance of liberating Raqqa as quickly as possible. And he says that the YPG is the only force on the ground that's capable of doing that with the U.S. air support. But the political leadership of the YPG has said they can't move on Raqqa while Turkey is attacking them at, in other places. So there seems to be a, a more general strategic problem. Why should the YPG fight and die to liberate Raqqa without getting anything in exchange? Uh. That is a classically loaded question, isn't it? <laughs> Look, um, uh, first of all, I'm not going to get ahead of military operations. I saw what comments were made by uh, defense leaders yesterday, um, and I'm not going to speculate about timing or composition or any of the operational uh, details with respect to Raqqa. Um, the secretary himself has said, publicly that we know we need um, uh, to remove Daesh from Raqqa, their so-called capital uh, of the caliphate, uh, uh, the so-called caliphate in, in Syria. 
uh, but I'm not going to get ahead of that. Number two, with respect to operations against Daesh, as I've said, I don't know how many times this week, we want, especially in that part of Syria, uh, in, uh, in that particular area, but ev everywhere, we want military activity to be coordinated. And uncoordinated military activity is counterproductive to the larger overarching goal, which is going after Daesh. Uh, and this gets to the continued reports of clashes between uh, 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 Syrian fighters on the ground and also uh, Turkish forces. Uh, we believe that this, this, these uncoordinated act activities are, are not helping us with the overall goal. Um, now, as to you know, who should do what and why should they do it and why shouldn't they do it, um, I think uh, obviously every uh, group uh, that's involved in the fight against Daesh, every entity, every, every nation has to make decisions for themselves uh, about what they will do or what they won't do. I can't get into their heads on that. What I can tell you is that, broadly speaking, the coalition, which is now 66 uh, nations strong and does include groups on the ground in Syria, obviously who aren't nations, I understand that, um, uh, maintain and should maintain their focus on Daesh as a common enemy, and that's where we want everybody to be focused from a military perspective. Uh, but but uh, uh, I, I can assure you that without getting into operational details, what, whatever the coalition uh, decides to do with respect to Daesh and Syria, it will be as a coalition, and it will be as a team. Um, and that's the only way that we're going to be able to sustain a lasting defeat of, of this group. Well, my question actually echoes a recent column by David Ignatius, who is, is raising the I've same. I've read it. Yeah, okay. I've read it. Is raising, raising the same issue. I know it was a difficult problem dealing with, with ISIS in, in this area and tends to postpone the most difficult aspects of that problem. But don't you need some kind of Turkish Kurdish reconciliation in order to? present to the YPG something reasonable in exchange for the sacrifices they're being asked to make? There, uh, first of all, we obviously respect and admire the sacrifices that they have made. And we recognize that they have been brave and courageous in the field. Um, and we have supported them uh, uh, through air power. Um, and I believe the general said yesterday that we'll continue to do that. Uh, uh, that the coalition will continue to support from the air um, what they're able to do on the ground, and that, that will continue. Now, you talked about Turkish-Kurdish reconciliation. Uh, I, I think it's no secret to anybody that there have been tensions there uh, uh, between the Kurds and between uh, and Turkey. Um, and we have long talked about the fact that we recognize that and that we have had discussions with Turkish leaders uh, about their apprehensions and their concerns. Um, we've also said that it's important as a coalition that we stay focused on Daesh um, and that to the degree everybody is capable of doing it, laying aside uh, other issues, um, other contentions, and uh, focusing on Daesh as required. And, uh, and again, as a coalition, we're going to continue to to make that case to every, to every member. I guess that, that President Erdogan and President Obama had a very long conversa phone conversation last night, and perhaps President Obama explained the importance of this to the Turkish president. But if you had earlier on told Erdogan, who seemed to have picked a fight with the Kurds in order to boost, their, boost his domestic position, that this was just unacceptable, particularly in current circumstances, might the situation not, now not be easier? Um, I, if we could we could Monday morning quarterback this all day long, and I'm not going to do that. Yes, the president had uh, a good discussion with the President Erdogan last night. I think the White House put out a, a readout of that. I'm not going to go beyond that. Um, uh, the, the Turkish uh, concerns about uh, Kurdish forces are, are longstanding, and we, we understand that. We recognize that. Uh, and we have, have and will continue to talk to them about those concerns. Um, but what we continue to believe is, is most important is that everybody focus on the fight against Daesh. That, that's where everybody's attention ought to be. Uh, now, Turkey is facing real terrorist threats uh, from the PKK. Um, and we recognize the PKK as a foreign terrorist organization. Um, and we have, once again, I'll, 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 we'll, we will call for, we have called for, uh, the PKK to lay down their arms, to renounce terrorism, and to go back to the negotiating table. Um, 
that's what needs to happen long term for the kind of peace and security and stability that I think the Turkish government and the Turkish people want and deserve. Uh, but we're going to continue to have these discussions, and uh, we're going to continue to press the case for the co a united coalition effort against Daesh. That's the common enemy. That that's the enemy of all the members of the coalition, and so it would follow that you'd want everybody focused on that common common threat. Do you have a, a, a general comment on the main thrust of, of uh, Mr. Ignatius's column, which is that the United States has a history of uh, using, exploiting, and then abandoning um, military allies in the Middle East? Well, I'm not going to, um, I don't know that I'd characterize his conclusions the same way, uh, but um, uh, I would argue that. Uh, wait, wait, you don't know what you would characterize it? I wouldn't characterize you would it not. the same way. Uh, okay. All right. Well, I just got with surprised all due respect, that you weren't. With all due respect, to Mr. It. Ignatius, and uh, and I know he's done some uh, some excellent reporting out of the region, and uh, that he uh, talks to to many people there. I, I fully respect uh, um, uh, what he says and and uh, where he gets his information. But I think, uh, uh, and I'm not saying that he said writ large that America has this reputation of. Uh, of abandoning allies, and I don't think it's borne by history. Uh, well, any reading of American history. The perception history. that this is, even if you don't agree with the conclusion, that is the perception in the region. Well, I can't speak for the perception of every person uh, in the region. I'm, I'm certainly not doubting the veracity of those who who, uh, who Mr. Ignatius talked to or who have also expressed uh, similar opinions. Uh, but, and I'm, I'm not. I'm not going to try to get in the mind uh, of, of everybody in, in the region. I can tell you that uh, unequivocally, the United States still maintains significant uh, interests in the region. Uh, we have significant commitments that we continue to meet in the region, not just in uh, with respect to Syria. Uh, and I don't think anybody can reasonably look at uh, recent history uh, and, and say that the United States is uh, abandoning our our friends and partners, or abandoning our, our responsibilities or the leadership role that we have taken. Whether it's Secretary Kerry leading efforts to establish the ISSG and to try to get a peaceful solution to the civil war in Syria, whether it's the United States leading, uh, putting together this 66 member nation uh, coalition uh, to fight Daesh in the region, or any uh, number of other issues that were, uh, that were leading the way on in the Middle East to try to get to better outcomes. Yeah. Do we need to move to Asia? Or are there more serious Asia. questions? Okay. Um, China, again, seems to be making a mockery out of these uh, UN Security Council uh, resolutions on uh, North Korea. According to the Korea International Trade Association, as reported by Yonhap, Chinese export of jet fuel to the DPRK jumped nearly 400% in September for a year earlier, so $9.7 million last month. Uh, the, uh, Ed, what, what are your concerns about this? What is the U.S. doing to try to close these loopholes? The only loopholes are supposed to be humanitarian concerns. It's hard to argue that infants are going to eat jet fuel in North Korea. And um, can you give us an update on um, basically what communications you're having with the Chinese about this. We routinely have conversations with uh, uh, the, the Chinese uh, about the importance of continuing pressure on the DPRK. We continue to urge the entire international community to fully implement and comply with the, the UN Security Council Resolution 2270. Chinese officials themselves have made clear that they intend to implement that resolution, and we're engaged in an ongoing dialogue. When are they going to implement? That they're going, that, that, that they have said they're, that they're, they are going to meet their obligations. When, when were the, when they, did they, did they say when they were going to do that? Because in addition to the um, jet fuel, it, I understand that coal has also risen. Um, ex, imports of um, North Korean coal to China have also increased since the resolution was actually passed, right? I, I'm not familiar with that particular fact. Uh, Elise, uh, what I can tell you is the Chinese have stated their intention to fully comply and to meet their requirements well, so under the it, is it, under the resolution, it, and our expectation and the expectation of the international community is that they will do that. And we have routine conversations with them. 
the, the deputy secretaries in the region, he will have these kinds of conversations as well with China. I understand, leadership. but I mean, I'm glad that they told you that they plan on doing it, but did they give you any kind of roadmap to when they're going to do we it? We have because already seen them implement, uh, implement uh, measures of the resolution. We've already seen them implement. But now, I mean, one of the main ones was coal, for instance. And I mean, like I said, it's not just, I mean, you don't have to take my word for it, but officials in your own building are saying that North Korean coal has increased into China since the resolution was passed. So, I mean, I'm glad that they told you that they're going to do it, but do you, how do you use your leverage to get them to actually do it? Because it's clear that they're, they're not doing it up till now. What do you there has do? been a historic uh, issue with, uh, with some nations meeting all their obligations under uh, UNSCRA resolutions, and, uh, and I've talked about it here publicly, that in the past we've not seen uh, China completely comply. Um, and when we have concerns about compliance, we're not going to be bashful about expressing them. We continue to have discussions with the Chinese about um, about their obligations and their commitments uh, uh, under this particular resolution and every other one before it. And we're going to and, and we'll continue has, to have. Has there been specific communication about coal and jet fuel going? I, I don't have. Yet. I'm not going to read out diplomatic conversations. Well, isn't that what your talks are about? Specifically strengthening those on the U, on this new U.S. Mm -hmm. resolution, isn't it? Just, specifically about strengthening those provisions? Uh, yes, we are talking to the international community and to other members of the UN Security Council about uh, about making sure we are staying in compliance with the resolutions already passed and considering the development and application of additional, maybe even tougher sanctions. Um, so obviously we're going to have to continue to talk to Chinese leaders in particular about this since China does have uh, perhaps more than other any other member has an economic stake here. I mean, with a border with the North, um, uh, and there have been problems with Chinese compliance in the past. I'm not going to dodge that, uh, uh, and we're going to continue to talk to them about their commitments going forward. Kirby, it's my understanding that coal is permitted under the so-called livelihood uh, clause of the most recent resolution, right? That's my understanding, but okay. I'm not an expert on this, and yep. I can't speak to specific coal shipments today. Yep. Well, okay, I think that's the case. So my next question was, is jet fuel permissible under, uh, I guess it's different because you're talking about coal exports from North Korea to China, but are, from, from your understanding, and if you don't know, could you take it, are Chinese jet fuel exports to North Korea permissible under existing legislation, I, under the existing sanctions? I don't know. I don't know. I'll have to see. Okay. I'm just not an expert on the language. I'll have to check. Yeah. Okay, first, uh, follow up on this. Uh, a few months ago, I had raised this question about the there is a corridor of trade between uh, North Korea and China, and uh, has the U.S. tried to ask for international monitors on that corridor because that's from through I'm which everything is going on. I'm not aware of any such request. because it, uh, the sanctions do not matter to North Korea with China having an open trade corridor going on. I think I've addressed this issue as far as I can today. Okay, the other one is about the um, diplomatic tit for tat going on between India and Pakistan. India expelled a diplomat, Pakistan expelled a diplomat, and now, you know, it, it, it's a rising tension. So are you worried about it? Do you have any comments on that? Uh, we've seen the reports of uh, of these decisions. These are sovereign decisions that nation states uh, make, and these are issues that uh, we're going to leave to India and Pakistan to work out. But in the past, uh, usually these decisions are followed by firing across the line, uh, across the borders, and then escalating into further. So well, obviously we don't want to see that happen, but let's not get ahead of events. Uh, okay. These are issues that uh, we believe India and Pakistan need to need to discuss, need to talk about, need to work out between themselves. Okay? Yeah. Uh, get back to North Korea, if that's okay. Uh, I'd like to circle back to the he said, he said between you and D&I Clapper a few days ago. I know you can't talk about specific intelligence, but can you broadly say that you share most of the same intelligence throughout the administration? I'm and not I, going to talk about intelligence matters <laughs> one way or the well, other. From the reason I ask this is because how can two people have, or two organizations have essentially the same intelligence and come to wildly different conclusions? He's saying there is no, there's no hope for doing nuclearization on the peninsula. You said a few minutes later that you know the U.S. remains committed to it. Who should we believe? <laughs> <laughs> Both. 
Thank you, Arshad. Uh, look, I think we all share concerns about the direction that the North is taking, all of us. And the concerns expressed by DNI Clapper are, are not new concerns, and, and we share them. We, we, we do share concerns about uh, the increasing provocative nature of not just their rhetoric, but their actions with respect to developing uh, nuclear weapons. No question about that. Um, and that's why uh, we continue to work inside the international community to put more pressure, to apply more pressure on the North. Um, that's why we're having an active conversation in the UN about the possibility for additional sanctions. And that's why we maintain a robust military presence on the peninsula, because we have real security commitments uh, to our South Korean allies and to the region uh, uh, to be able to respond militarily if that's required. Uh, uh, so I think everybody has, everybody shares the same sense of urgency here. I didn't see a, a big gulf between what the director said and what we've been saying all along. Um, uh, the question that was posed to me was: Is it, uh, is, what, you know, is that U.S. policy that we're just that we're that we're going to give up on trying to achieve a, a verifiable denuclearization of the peninsula? And the answer is very simple: No, it's not. And that's not just the State Department. It's not. It's not just one agency. It's the entire U.S. government. Our policy is the same. We want to see a verifiable denuclearization uh, on the peninsula. Uh, now, it is. I don't think it should come as a shock to anybody that, that, that people may have different views about the odds of achieving that. But that is the goal, uh, and that's what we're after. And the best way to do that is a return to the six-party talk process. Uh, and we've said all along we're ready to do that. The onus is on the North to prove that they're able and willing, and thus far uh, they have not proven willing to do that. Part of this trying to influence the debate for the next administration, which by my calculations I think is the 13th that will be dealing with the North Korean issue? It is, what, is it trying to influence the debate for what the is? next administration? Like this, you say there's no gulf, but one says that there's not possible. You're saying you're still committed to it. Usually these aren't in public, these sort of disagreements. So I'm just, Again, I, I take issue with the fact that there's some big disagreement here. Um, but let's put that aside for a, a second. Um, I, uh, the, the concerns about what's going on in North Korea are not set by, established by, affected by the political calendar here in the United States. I, I'm well aware we have an election coming up. And I think we're all well aware that in January we're going to have a new president. And that new president will have to make decisions uh, about uh, where things are going with respect uh, to North Korea. But what we're focused on is is uh, what has been not just on this administration but administrations past uh, is a consistent policy of applying pressure to the North and trying to achieve a verifiable, complete denuclearization of the peninsula, which we think is in the best interest not only uh, of the people who live on the peninsula, North and South, uh, but everybody in the region, if not here in the United States. Um, so I, I just don't see it the same way you do. Uh, I, I got that uh, you know, uh, that he offered a frank assessment. That's his job. He's the head of intelligence for the United States of America, and his job is to be candid. His job is to look at threats, and his job is to assess uh, where things are going. Uh, but that doesn't mean that he was saying any, that he was, you know, denouncing or walking back or changing our policy objectives, which is that denuclearization. So I just, just don't see it the same way you do. Yeah. Japan. Do you have anything on the fact that your allies are going to restart GSOMIA? I'm the sorry, I couldn't GSOMIA, hear you. GSOMIA, the military information sharing? I, I'm sorry, so, I, you have to repeat your question. I didn't all right. It. Can you hear me better now? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Do you have any comment on the fact that the ROK and Japan are going to start talks on GSOMIA, the military information oh, okay. sharing? I'm Thanks. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we did note the recent announcement by uh, the governments of the Republic of Korea and Japan to resume negotiations on what's called a bilateral general security of military information agreement, which is I think you called JISOMIA. I'll, uh, I'll defer to you on how to pronounce that acronym. Um, we believe that uh, this potential agreement 
uh, would strengthen cooperation uh, between our two closest allies in Northeast Asia, particularly in light of the growing threat uh, posed by North Korea. So we welcome the fact that they're having those discussions. Okay, I got time for just a couple more. Staying in the region, do you have a readout on Deputy Secretary Blinken's trilateral in Tokyo with his Korean and Japanese counterparts? Yeah. So on the trilateral meeting, uh, uh, the, the Deputy Secretary had productive discussions uh, with both his uh, counterparts uh, from Japan and from uh, South Korea. Uh, they reaffirmed the importance of our trilateral cooperation in maintaining peace and stability in the Asia-Pacific region, particularly regarding the threat posed by uh, the DPRK nuclear and ballistic missile programs. They also reiterated the important contributions uh, our trilateral cooperation continues to make on global issues, including things like climate change, global health, uh, and women's empowerment. So good discussions. Okay. <laughs> now I'm not going to let you get out of here that easily. First uh, I got two. They're, they're brief, though. Um, yeah. They're both kind of I've involved. I've heard that before. They both kind of involve the UN. One, it, uh, you may have seen that the uh, Burundi formally notified the UN today that they were uh, withdrawing from the International Criminal Court, which prompted Ambassador Power to suggest that the Burundian government was memorializing its, um, I can't remember her exact word, something like its passion or its approval or uh, approval of impunity. Um, do you have anything to add to her comments? Uh, well, no, I, I, I don't think I can improve upon that. I mean, obviously, uh, 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 we're following these developments uh, these clo the, uh, this closely. And um, again, uh, um, you know, I, I wouldn't also get ahead of events or speculate one way or the other. But I mean, I think we share her, her general sense of concern. Uh, I, I think actually it was something about the, their opposition to accountability or something like that. Anyway. Um, but you don't, you don't have anything I don't. more to add. All right. Uh, and then earlier this week, there was a UN expert speaking up at, uh, at, the, at the UN in New York about Haiti and the cholera e epidemic. And in his comments, he described the UN response as a disgrace um, and also alluded to or suggested, hinted maybe in another word, that the reason the UN took the position that it took um, when people tried to get some accountability for the the introduction of cholera into into Haiti was at the behest of the United States can you address that is that is that correct did you pressure or push the UN into not responding no we did not uh, we've been very clear that we do not take a position on the validity of the underlying claims in this particular case. Do not take a position. But you did take a position in favor of the United Nations, correct? What well, we've said is we support efforts by the Special Rapporteur to give greater prominence to the plight of those living in extreme poverty. Uh, we've said before that we welcomed uh, the Secretary General's acceptance of the UN's moral responsibility for the cholera outbreak and his recent statement uh, expressing regret for the, the loss of life. Uh, we've also said we recognize more must be done, and we support the UN's ongoing efforts to design an assistance package to assist those most affected by cholera, including in the wake of Hurricane Matthew. So we look forward to receiving the Secretary General's proposal for the provision of a package of assistance and support to, to Haitians most affected uh, by the cholera. Thanks. And then the... Sorry, just that. Why, uh, just so I'm clear, I think Matt's fundamental question was, did the U.S. government at any time uh, uh, discourage the U.N. from taking responsibility, right? Was that fundamentally your question? And, and did you ever do that in the past? I'm not aware that we discouraged them from taking that responsibility. I said we, we welcome that no, the Secretary that. General said it was a moral responsibility. But with respect to the actual claims, we did not take a position on the validity of the underlying claims in this case. But couldn't you, discour di di couldn't you discourage them from taking responsibility even if you don't take a position on the underlying claims? 
look, you could say, look, I don't know who did this, but it's going to be bad if you take responsibility. So don't do that. I mean, could we have? I, I don't know. I suppose we could have. I'm not aware that we did. What I can tell you is we did not take a position on the underlying claims, and we did welcome uh, the Secretary General's actions and his comments on, on this matter going forward. The last one, this is extremely brief, and is that you, you talked several times about this, the anti-ISIS co uh, coalition being 66 nations. Is that up recently? No. Have new members? Afghanistan joined uh, several months ago, making it 66. Okay. Thanks. All right. Thanks.